Hello, and welcome to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. This show is presented to you by Gaslowitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether through your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news, pictures, and tips, go to our website at gaslowitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are Craig Frankel and Robert Port, and we're talking about how to help your aging parents get the help they need when they need it. And now it's time to introduce our guests. We are pleased to have with us today Nanette Duffy, CEO and Professional Daily Money Manager at Organized Instincts, and Kendall Cry, Care Manager Certified at Life at Aging Life Care of Atlanta. Um, Kendall and uh, Nanette, we'd like to start off by having you uh, introduce yourselves to our audience and explain a little bit about what your uh, firms and practices do. So Kendall, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, I have worked in the senior care industry my entire career from really before I was an adult, <laughs> teenage years and nursing and if you, homes. And if you look at her, you can't see her on the radio. That was about <laughs> yesterday. Oh, stop. You're sweet. I colored the grays yesterday. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so I've been doing healthcare, senior care about 20 years and um, worked in assisted living environments, skilled nursing environments, and got into consulting uh, about four or five years ago and really saw the need that people needed help individually, you know, not from a company perspective of this is how we believe you should take care of all people in a facility and really saw the need for people to be cared for based on what's going on in their life. And um felt like I could really help folks in a more effective way and uh, it's been a great a great job to um, you know fulfill my set my life you know my heart's desires of helping others and and pay the bills <laughs> so it's a blessing <laughs> well, that's terrific I can tell you're very excited about mm-hmm. what you do Nanette let's hear from you yep funny Kendall should mention paying the bills because that's one of the things that I love to do and this started as a lifelong passion for myself. I remember being a child with my bank book and my parents teaching me lessons about finances and it was something I was so passionate about. Well, but you can thank your parents that you actually learned. I remember that passbook that used to sit in my father's desk and that concept of compound interest was something that I carry forward with me today as a daily money manager, teaching and helping seniors and busy professionals manage their finances and not be intimidated by that. 13 years ago, I started this, what was a passion project for me to become a professional daily money manager and make an impact on the world and the people's lives that we touch as a company, giving them independence and peace of mind. And it's what every day gets me out of bed. The the hugs and the thanks that we get from clients and reassurance for me that this was the path that I was put on. It was a little windy road to get here, but I love it every day. And to make that impact is something really special, not just behind a computer screen, but to really leverage my talents and show the world what we can do for so, families. So understanding finances and dealing with people, is that an oxymoron? You know, it is, and I've been told by uh, executive coaches and a career counselor I talked to many years ago, it takes a unique skill set to be able to balance those communicating with people and having that personal connection while also having that analytical mind. Let's take a step back though and let just tell our listeners what is a daily money manager and let, let's focus on aging parents though I know you do beyond that. What does a daily money manager do or can a money a daily money, money manager do for our aging parents? For that adult child and that aging parent, what we can do is be an advocate and a problem solver. That means we can do simple things like helping seniors pay their bills and making sure they're not victims of financial fraud or exploitation. We can help them save money and really help them from Mate, or help them, I'm sorry, maintain their control and their independence. As seniors, as we start to lose some of our other capacities, finances are such a personal and intimate conversation that bringing in an outside party can be intimidating, but bringing in a professional can help them be positive, upbeat, and reassure them that their latter years are going to be comfortable and positive, not filled with shame or embarrassment. And they don't have to tell their kids everything if they don't want to. Exactly. Their secrets are safe. Kendall, let's hear from you as to what a care manager does. And and the way I think about it is 
what would you do if I were to call you out of the blue, if I got a referral to you, and I said, you know, I have uh, aging mom, aging dad, and I've heard someone like you can help me. What, what would you want to know about? What's the process to get started? Sure. Well, I want to know what made you make that call? What's happening at home? Uh, what are your safety concerns? Um, what are you worrying about at night? Um, what, what are those phone calls from them that you're trapped at work and you can't get to them? And what are those missing prescriptions that you can't track down? They don't know what they are. All those things that you just don't have a grasp on that just happen um, without it, you know, there's no plan in place. And so, you know, oftentimes I refer to myself as a professional daughter or like a private social worker. You know, I can jump right in. You know, I can, I certainly give folks um, a very formal assessment and care plan recommendation. I can do that. Uh, but also I like to just jump in and find out, okay, well, we need to track down that prescription that you don't know what it is and which pharmacy it was sent to and when are you supposed to take that? Um, so I do have a very hands-on approach, um, but certainly a big picture approach of let's take care of your living accommodations or your emergency plans or your estate documents and those kind of things as well. So what, do you, what are your suggestions for the adult child who's calling you? How do you suggest they begin that conversation with their parent or parents? Because that generation my assessment is very self-sufficient, uh, independent, mm -hmm. proud, yes. sometimes stubborn. <laughs> um, and how, how do you, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you help the, the uh, child uh, suggest that the services of someone like you would be uh, beneficial? Yeah, I always say start with the most sincere intentions. You do it because you love them or because you're concerned about their well-being. And if you start from a very sincere place, I think that lays a very <coughs> um, firm foundation of this is only because I care and maybe admit your own inexperience and I've never taken care of anybody or I've never been involved in someone whose life involves, you know, safety needs and me lots of medical concerns or changing uh, abilities uh, that's not my skill set so let's find someone who knows what they're doing now the, 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 the your client so to speak generally is going to be the adult child not the aging parent or is that a misconception it's a misconception uh, ethically as um, a certified care manager um, the aging life care association views the client as the senior always even if the adult child is the one who hires, retains, and pays me, I'm still obligated to the senior of their wishes, albeit with all the safety concerns considered. Like one example, I had a, a family whose father was an alcoholic and he was drinking, it made him so- By the way, a really bigger problem than people realize. As you age, you often drink more because you oh, forget. For, yeah. Yes. What, how much you're drinking and you're alone a lot more mm -hmm. and your body responds differently. So we're seeing For a sure. lot of people late in life drinking or reacting to alcohol very differently than perhaps they did in their prime. Absolutely. And then that fall when they've had too much to drink is far more devastating. So this gentleman had been through that cycle and his daughter wanted me to sneak in medicine into his daily pill planner that would help reduce his cravings for alcohol. She hired me. I knew that it would be safer for him not to drink, but because he was not cognitively impaired, he's not demented, he doesn't have Alzheimer's, he has every right to drink when he wants to drink, even when it's unsafe. And certainly we'll call 911 and we'll have interventions, but I can't sneak medicine into his pillbox just because it would make him safer. That violates his rights as an individual to make his own decisions. And that, let's ask the question kind of you, to you differently. So. I said there might be a misconception as to who would be going to a care planner, someone going to a daily money manager for an aging adult. Who is your client? Is it now, I would have assumed it would be the adult is really your client whom you're talking to, but are you being approached by the children? Now it's interesting to Kendall's point, our client is always the senior, assuming that they still have cognitive ability to make their own decisions and there aren't legal documents in place or legal actions that would prevent that. But they're the client, they're still the decision maker. So it can be very simple things. What we do find is clients come to us in one of two ways. 
it's the adult child who's farther away, can't see mom or dad, but is starting to notice things, get confusing phone calls, or on visits, it's very tension-filled and finances come up. For the adult seniors, what we'll often find <coughs> is we'll be working with a client and a friend will pop by to their apartment, to their home, and we will often get an introduction that way. And the senior will say, I didn't know I could get help with this. I've really been struggling. If they're not using computers, there's there's not a Yellow Pages directory for Daily Money Manager, unfortunately. Is there a Yellow Pages at all? <laughs> <laughs> exactly the point. But that's where the senior is going, and they're trying to flip through that print book, and they don't know how to get help. So for those seniors, it's asking maybe a friend or an introduction as the client. They're at a loss that this service even exists. So it's that adult child, if you're out there, this service does exist, and you can get your parent help through the American Association of Daily Money Managers, AAD. Mm. com. Oh, that'll be easy for seniors to remember. <laughs> exactly. Alphabet suit. But for those adult children that are searching for someone uh, throughout the United States, that's a resource they can go check out and find someone if they want uh, a local resource to help their if, parent. If the, if the parent is your client and you're getting to see them more, but the child is often out of town mm -hmm. and you start to notice something funky, changes in the parent... Are you allowed to? Are you supposed to? Can you call the child and say you may want to check in or things like that? This is an interesting industry dilemma and the way we approach it at Organized Instincts is through our engagement with our senior clients when we start with them. If they have cognitive ability, we engage with them and we straight out ask them. And we get their authorization from the beginning of who we can speak to, adult children, include or exclude certain children, advisors, and really become part of their team and engage in that conversation. We have seniors that say, you're not allowed to talk to A, B, or C, and we honor and respect that. But we also have some language that will say, if we notice impairment or changes, do we have your authorization now so that we could make that phone call? What we advocate for is starting the conversation early so that we're not forced to make that phone call from a legal perspective we are not mandatory reporters um, such as a school teacher or other professional might be but uh, that's a struggle that as an industry we do face and let me let me mention what for, for for our listeners what a mandatory reporter is states have different rules as to certain professionals who are serving clients that are aging and when they see potentially um, abuse or something like that, they may have an obligation. So emergency room doctors, even lawyers and some financial professionals is, is a kind of a tip. This is really an area that is going to expand around the country. And Georgia is not all that atypical, but we're going to see a lot more mandatory reporting. And so we should be aware of that. And it puts everyone in a difficult position to know when and what, but we should be looking at this because the industry of, of elder abuse, particularly financial abuse, is huge. In fact, I think they actually have a professional organization in Florida that just teaches you how to abuse financially the elders that you see moving from New York. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, Nanette, let me circle back a little bit to something we touched upon with Kendall, which was how do you broach the idea in your field, you're dealing with money, and often that's something that, again, I'll say the, the greatest generation, if you will, is not usually in the habit of talking about their money, sharing what's going on with their children, anything else. How, how do you suggest the children or others who may have a concern broach the idea that the services of someone like you would be helpful? similar to what Kendall said, is to start the conversation with care and compassion and honesty and be prepared for it to not be the first time you have the conversation. So I mean like your mom leaving the room and locking herself in her bedroom, which I'm telling you clients have told me about. It, it, hap <laughs> it happens every day and we will have multiple conversations. So it's starting it in a non-threatening manner and for an adult child being open and honest that it's coming from a place of care and concern and also be ready to expose some of your own difficulties 
with money and the money relationship. I've seen some tremendous growth for both a senior and an adult child to really heal some wounds that they have and some attitudes about money through this process. So as an adult child, be willing for your parent to say no, but also be willing to start the conversation and then revisit over and over again. You're listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts, Craig Frankel and Robert Port from the fiduciary law firm of Gaslowitz Frankel. We are talking about helping aging parents cope with financial management and care decisions, and we are pleased to be speaking with Nanette Duffy, CEO of Organized Instincts, and Kendall Cry with Aging Life Care of Atlanta. Kendall, let me ask you. So Mm -hmm. now a family has come and they're concerned about their parent. They live in Bogota and the parent lives in, you know, suburban Atlanta and they want to start having the conversation. How do they start and and do you ever play a role in helping them start? Absolutely. Um, And like uh, Lynette said, you just have to keep talking about it. Um, It really doesn't usually happen from just one good conversation, but certainly equipping adult children with those key phrases of, you know, safety concerns, you're at risk for identity theft, um, you know, playing that worst case scenario. Um, Sometimes people have already done the basic power of attorney, advanced directive documents, and you can use that as your foundation of, well, mom, you you already said years ago that if you can't, so we're usually in this gray area. Well, mom's still making decisions, but they're just not all that great or safe, so you're not effectively her power of attorney yet, but you use that as your foundation of, well, mom, I'm obligated now as your power of attorney. I'll you know, be in trouble, that guilt on those parents of it's my job and I'll get in trouble with adult protective services. If someone were to find out you're driving unsafe or you're living at home unsafe, some of those things can be really effective. Other times people are far too intelligent and sharp and they're like, you're full of baloney. I'm doing whatever I want to do and you're not going to tell me otherwise. They really baloney. Interesting. Oh, they do. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. (laughs) And so... You just keep trying and and you say, okay, if you don't believe me, if you're not going to listen to me, then let's get someone who's objective, someone who's not in the middle of our family dynamics, someone who's close in Atlanta, someone who my friend told me about, definitely like Nanette said, that personal connection, because we're getting nosy. You know, I, I show up and I ask a lot of nosy questions, personal questions, and so it's got to feel comfortable. Um, so you, you touched upon something that is a constant issue in this area, which is driving. Mm-hmm. We, we'd, we'd like to hear from both of you as to your suggestions mm-hmm. how to have that very difficult conversation. Mom or dad, you shouldn't be behind the wheel anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I've My s- children have had that conversation with <laughs> me already, <laughs> which I find a tad offensive. <laughs> so well, you know, tell me how, the, how they should do it sure. later. Thank God for Uber. We'll all be okay eventually. But this generation, not so sharp with Uber. Um, there are senior Ubers. Let's, let's tell our listeners there are several services now yes. where you can call and they'll handle it for you, including tracking for the kids. Yes. And most assisted living and independent living provide that service as well. You call the front desk and they do it. And I have found seniors hesitant to use it the first mm-hmm. couple times. It is fantastic. Absolutely. Um, so I have found in recent years, I wouldn't say this is true earlier in my career, but doctors are getting braver about it, um, where they are not only joining the conversation but leading the conversation which is wonderful um don't because, be aff- because that's a group in, in usually internist, this internist this, yes. this generation will respect that's right the primary care physician the neurologist if there's a psychiatrist involved those kind of physicians are thankfully braver to talk about it and um can even issue a driving evaluation that's an actual order or prescription and it lingers on their records until you get it done and that's can i get really a stack of those like in a pad that <laughs> yeah. i can just hand out yeah <laughs> just put your little signature on hand them out as you're driving down the road right um 
And so then you can use the doctor's order as your, well, we got to do it. That's what the doctor said. Um, certainly, it's not always that simple. And again, you, you know, I hate to call it a scare tactic, but sometimes that's what's necessary of a story of someone who had some tragic accident. And that's what worked for a client of mine. I have a client who's um, extremely intelligent, uh, actually a medical doctor, and um, <clears throat> She was really holding on to this driving with cognitive impairment, and it was finally the fear of hurting someone else. It was, I don't think I will cause it, but what if I couldn't respond and react and I did something tragic? And that was what finally worked. So, um, What's interesting to me is I've read of studies where in the general population, everyone thinks they're a better than average driver everyone which is statistically <laughs> impossible but then you move into that other generation and and you know the dynamic changes tremendously so that that's an interesting way to to approach the overconfidence and mm -hmm. self-confidence uh, people like to feel about their driving Nanette, do you have any suggestions on the on the driving issue? That's not really within what you may do, but you probably see that a lot. I, I, what we tend to see is we'll start to see the bumps and scrapes along the fender. And going back to bringing up the conversation with parents about finances, it's again a place from care and compassion about honoring that senior's independence. And one of the things we've found is with the driving conversation is, can we start with a trial run, the, the Uber ride? Can we try a month with a daily money manager and see how you like it? It's often- Oh, I like the idea of a trial. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. It, I, th I liken it to when we're a parent and trying to introduce a new vegetable to children and you say... Okay, well, that didn't work, so, so you, yeah. you've lost me there. One, you, one, you green, have to. one green bean at a time, right? Exactly. So we used to call them green french fries. That worked for one of the three kids. So that same sort of approach and appealing to their sensibilities. One of the other things we've used, uh, both on the driving front, is appeal to that great generation's... Um, conservative financial nature and say, wouldn't you like to save money on your car insurance, save money by not getting charged for an accident? So appealing to their financial frugality mm -hmm. is another approach that sometimes can flip the switch. When your your when comment about the getting in little dips and scrapes, I've heard of a situation where, where the, the uh, couple between the two of them the the husband kept a can of spray paint in the car <laughs> and would periodically go out and spray over the little scrapes and and bumps he'd put on the car to try and uh you know deal with that particular <laughs> issue I, I i have a uh, from my own personal and family situation i had uh, uh, an elderly relative who came to the decision to stop driving all on their own and approached one of my parents and said, you know, could you help me stop driving and think through this process? And you're a family member that's not local, a little bit more distance in the family tree, and that's where the comfort was, rather than an immediate family member, which I found very intriguing. Mm. So for family that's a niece or a nephew, sometimes that conversation with that family member might go better. Oh, that's interesting because I, I mean, I've done this with my aunt and uncle that they sometimes will call me rather than their children mm -hmm. just for whatever reason. Let, let's get a little more practical here. So when you're doing daily money management, do you have check writing authority? Are there limits to what you can do? Do you have to get approval of the client to sign things? How does it work? There were lots of yeses in that in, to those questions, Craig, but what we try to do is honor that senior and work with the family and have them maintain control. If they're able to cognitively still sign checks on our trial run that we talked about is helping them still uh, prepare checks, but then they can sign them. We deal with seniors with arthritic hands. Um, simple changes, large scale checks, and those abilities help the senior maintain their independence and they absolutely love that. So we don't take over a signing authority. When you get into signing and having control of accounts, that requires other things like powers of attorney. Uh, we will sometime engage children that have power of attorney and find unique s solutions that allow 
of the client to have their independence and still have control as long as humanly possible. Do you also take a look at things like uh, insurance, make sure the insurance is either appropriate or certainly taken care of, make sure that all the bills are going to one place as opposed to coming in in the mail and one gets left on this credenza and one's carried into the bedroom and left there. I'm presuming organizing skills are a large part of what you do. Would that be fair? It's funny, Robert, that you say that. I actually began Organized Instincts in the professional organizing sphere, and it's... That's the name? That was, that was, that was a, a, a lead-in for, for, you, to, for uh, you to mention the, the firm name again. Exactly. Well, thank you for that, mm-hmm. Kula. But yes, organizing and having that skill as a daily money manager is crucial, and it's one of the key components we bring to clients that they don't realize we offer it's just how we operate and you mentioned the male hunt and and (laughs) that's one of the things as an adult child you may start to notice when you go to mom or dad's house that mail is in odd places and it's in lots of different places so finding that and asking clients questions about the charities they like to donate for and who are the family members and what's this check for Uh, Those are some of the things we look for when we engage and as we change um, relationships with seniors. But in terms of the insurance, medical supplement plans, there are so many things that a daily money manager could possibly help with that can make the senior's life easier, more enjoyable. So making sure if they're still driving, are they covered adequately? Are they paying the right amount? My, my classic example is a senior who's paying for three cell phone plans because they didn't realize that their iPad had a plan and their cell phone and their this, their duplicate paying. So advocating for the client and making sure they have appropriate coverages, medical coverages, bills are paid on time, that mail is not disappearing out of the mailbox. Identity theft is a huge risk. And when you have a senior living in a multi-use property, the mailman unfortunately puts mail in the wrong mailbox. So we're there to help the client ensure that the bills are coming on time and they're going out on time. Do you, for example, get copies by electronic to yourself even though they're still getting mail? Or do you ever do where you kind of in the back end, so to speak, in the back office, make sure it's happening regardless of what's happening in the front office. Exactly, yeah, finding that balance is interesting. Our favorite story is a 93-year-old client of ours that came to us and said, you know, my arthritis in my hand is really making paying bills difficult. Can you teach me how to pay them online? Wow. (laughs) And she was so excited and so intrigued, but she didn't have a resource, and her children were too busy, her grandchildren, we're too busy to do it. So, yes, it's electronic, it's paper, it's all the means necessary to ensure that they're safe and secure and their finances are in order. So, Kendall, one, one of the issues we uh, not unsurprisingly run into in our litigation practice is that, surprise, surprise, children don't get along mm-hmm. and they have different points of view. Sure. Um, tell us about, um, you know, how you approach those issues you know the son wants x the daughter wants y the other child is ambivalent how do you navigate those difficult issues right well you know there's that good book how to win friends and influence people i start with those foundations of just trying to get people to a listen to me you know not that i have all the answers but they'll at least respect my objective perspective um and always keeping the safety of the parent you know, first and foremost. And when you go back to that principle of the senior as the client, instead of their motives and what they want and what, you know, the opposite opinions are about, it's actually about what's safest and what does your mom want. And so um, helping them identify what has mom always said is she always said, I want to stay in my home as long as I can. But everyone says that. So it, I'm not sure that's all that helpful. Well, but if that's what mom wants, and she can't afford it, then you can start with your reason why you look at other options. Okay. How, how about if mom wants to stay, but dad says, I'm tired, I'd like mm-hmm. to be taken care of, I don't want my wife to be working in the kitchen. Sure. That's also a dynamic that's gotta be incredibly yeah, the, difficult. Yeah, those are fun. And so <laughs> when I sit down with the married couple, and I, you know, oftentimes people don't have these 
solid conversations in person. They're just little things in passing. And so to facilitate the actual conversation, to have the husband say to the wife and have the wife say to the husband and get it all out there and you're, say- You're almost a therapist. Absolutely, or, or like a mediator. And I've had some training in mediation. And so a way to say, well, what's the ultimate goal for each other? Then are you ready to live apart? And I've had several married couples kind of like taken aback, like, well, no, I'm not gonna not be with my spouse after 50 something years. And so then you say, okay, so. By the way, I see the reverse often in families that I, I really am actually ready, that I, I don't wanna be the caregiver. Mm -hmm. And that's hard too. For sure. Not, and it's hard to say. Yes, yes. Uh, so if you just help people identify that sometimes what happens in your later in life years it's not what you planned. So you always wanted to stay at home, but you didn't know you were gonna get Alzheimer's. And so now that diagnosis changes the game. And so now we have to go based on safety, physical safety, cognitive support, medical support, and we have to change our perspective. We're listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts, Robert Port and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gastelich Frankel. And we're talking with Annette Duffy of Organized Instincts and Kendall Cry with Aging Life Care of Atlanta, talking about helping aging parents cope with financial management and care decisions. Kendall, one of the problems that I often see is the child comes home to visit the parent once a month, once a year at Christmas, and they say, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize things were so bad, however one defines bad, but they now have you know, 35 seconds to figure out what it is, confront the parents, hire you, <laughs> hire Nanette. They don't know what to do. How does that visiting family member deal with things in a way that's productive and not destructive? Right. Um so thankfully, you know, with cell phones and email, we can continue to communicate when they head home. And so oftentimes I get that call as they're, well, I'm headed to the airport in the morning and I don't really have any more time today because we gotta go to the grocery store and pick up the drugs and blah, 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 and there's no time left. And so many times it just starts with a phone call with the daughter and the son on a conference call. We speak together about those concerns and they lay the groundwork of telling mom, hey mom, we found this person, we're really concerned. Uh, and so oftentimes I go meet the senior when nobody else is there. The daughter's gone back to Boston and gone back to work. How were you introduced to the senior? Yeah, you know, just as a consultant, an aging consultant, to be sure you're safe, to be our eyes and ears because we can't be there, to be uh, your advocate. Do, do you write up anything so that, you know, people sometimes hear what they want to hear? Mm -hmm. If you've got children in different locations yes. and from, from the parents and on the phone, you could say, this is what I think, this is what I saw. Child X will hear this, <laughs> child Y will hear that, and the parents will hear something different. Do you right. do, you do a, any sort of written yes. recommendation? I do, yes. I can give a pretty formal written care plan. It really is... Uh, customized per family you know if I've got a family you know with a couple of attorneys <laughs> you know this is gonna be pretty um, bullet point and outlined and very clear if I've got a family of retired you know preschool teachers then it might be a little more informal uh, it really just depends on and the needs crayon. of the family <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> not to say that preschool teachers don't want a formal approach but sometimes they just you know some people just want you to just jump in and help and others want a clear plan with a path and an outline to get there Okay. And so, you know, being that I'm, you know, it's just me, so I, I want to curtail that to the family. It's not my way. It's what's going to work best for y'all to do this together. Right. And and obviously, it's best if everyone is on the same page mm -hmm. to the extent it can be, and mm -hmm. you don't get push and pull from others. <laughs> and that, let's ask kind of the same question to you. My impression, which may be false, is that some families, particularly adult children, come in, see the same thing. Oh, my God, they're not paying their bills. There's a crisis and they come to you in a crisis situation. How do you step in in, a, in that type of situation? Well, it's interesting, yes, crisis is all in the eyes of the beholder. And so the adult child who rams in, flings open the door and says, my parents are disorganized and they're not paying their bills on time, may be the lens in which the adult child is looking at the world and the situation. So 
we often have the conversation with both parties, an adult child, and say, well, what is your expectation of what mom or dad or mom and dad should be doing? And, and how do you do it in your own life? Because that gives us a little peek into what their expectations are. Then we'll have a similar conversation with the senior and try to assess, have things started to shift for them? Have they always been lax and, you know, I pay my bills in this way? Or how has their life and approach to money and paying the bills been? And I see, I see a lot of families changing. So the, the, the wife or a spouse may have handled the bill and the other spouse now because of the is starting to take it over or to start be concerned that his or her spouse isn't able to do it or doesn't want to do it but they're not necessarily capable or understand the other spouse may resent how does that play out that is a huge challenge for us as we have these couples that are together and all of the financial responsibility fell to one person and i, I can't say this enough and as an adult child or as a senior, this is the conversation we have before the crisis starts. Because when a family's in crisis and the person who has an illness or has lost ability and they were the one that paid the bills, the other spouse or another family member who's dealing with the caregiving aspect of it, it isn't the time for them to suddenly now, after 65 years, learn all of the accounts and how to pay the bills. So that's where a daily money manager can step in and help fulfill that need, even if it's short term. So Kendall basically would have a speed dial for you that <laughs> says, right. wait a second, <laughs> I can solve this problem easily. Let's focus on the other ones. And on you, when you see them aging, you have a speed dial to Kendall to say, hey, you know what? Maybe somebody could help you all make these decisions. I'll just focus on the money. So Ex this could be a win-win. Absolutely. It's part of that whole team approach. And that's what is a way we like to think about it. It's the geriatric care manager, the financial advisory, the insurance folks. It's a team approach and that's how we love to approach clients is who are your professionals and we're all here to support you. So a geriatric care manager, a daily money manager are just two new pieces of that team. Absolutely. And can I highlight something you said and we say this in virtually every radio show talk early and often it's like voting like we did yesterday mm -hmm. early and often that if you can have these conversations before there's a crisis everyone is better off and that's the huge challenge in absolutely. virtually every issue with aging parents yeah absolutely and i think because your health needs change so often means that that conversation this year might have been, might be different than it was last year because you now have a new diagnosis or a new situation or a new financial picture that have changed things and even myself my parents and I talk about it often and and their wishes have changed at, from when they were in their 60s to now they're in their mid 70s what they want for their later life is different than it was 10 years ago so you do have to keep talking about it let me let me kind of change a question do you advise your adult children who may in fact of course have adult children of their own do you advise them to start talking to their children yes. and use that as an opening for their parents absolutely I, I have a family that I worked with who had just a long unfortunate generation of Alzheimer's in their family and the son had been so wonderfully caring for his mother and he said he wanted to go get the genetic testing for Alzheimer's to see if he had the gene so that he could be prepared. And I said to him, you know, so your children have been involved with you taking care of your mom and you've shown them how to take care of someone. They know what to do. And wouldn't you think that that answer could really alter your future? You know, if you, the thing about Alzheimer's specifically is you don't ever know when yours is going to show up. Maybe you have the gene, but maybe it doesn't affect your life until you're 90. And maybe your life had a different track of something in your 80s and you never went through all that. And so uh, I said, just talk with your children about what kind of environment you want to be in if that happens to you. And you've led by example. And you, this is a conversation you all have every day because your mom's involvement in your life. And... Um, you, know, you can lead by example and talk to those younger generations that certainly aren't thinking about this, the millennials, I guess, so you'd say, and um, they need to hear it from you of what your values are. Well, well, both your services are obviously very much needed as we look at the population and the demographics. Why don't each of you give our listeners some sense of 
what the cost is for hiring you, how it's structured, how it's priced, so they can have a feel as to what they're looking at. Kendall? Yeah, sure. So my pricing is just an hourly consulting fee. It's $130 an hour. And my company, I have a little more relaxed approach and I find that's more effective with these seniors that are concerned about their finances and think that that's a lot of money. And so uh, I don't require a retainer fee. I don't require an assessment fee. Some care management firms have kind of a flat rate assessment rate. Mine is if it takes me you know, three hours to meet with you, dig into the information and come up with a plan, then it's a three hour charge. Um, I can bill in half hour increments at the minimum. So I just try to keep it casual so that I can just jump in and help and just give them the resources they need. Give us an idea of how and how long, you know, when you start off is probably a more intensive process. Definitely. You know, five hours, 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And then as the team moves forward, hopefully for many, many years of successful decisions, how often you're involved with the family, not not necessarily in dollars, but in time. Right. You know, it's really different for every family because some people only need five hours up front of let me dig in and see where the safety concerns are. Let me give you resources for each point, you know, give referrals for home care providers and facilities or placement companies or physicians and get you on your way. And then, right. you know, you've, you've laid out it. the plan for right. them. Right. And, and, and there's people, going that's forward. right. And they're able bodied and they're nearby and they can execute the plan. Other folks, they just say, Simply live in London and <laughs> so they're not here to help and so not only I execute the plan but then I follow through on the details and I'm communicating constantly with the home care provider or with the administration at the assisted living facility or with the physician about the medication changes or uh, anyone involved in their life or the money manager about the concerns we're seeing with the bill paying or whatever it may be and I'm, I'm like that professional daughter that keeps all those wheels moving and communicating together. Let's, let's Nanette, let's, let's hear from you about uh, how you structure your fees. And initially, one of the trial run, as we call it, sort of an introductory month of service, usually runs about $175, $150. So it's a really a... Per, per month? Per month. That's, and from my perspective, that's a bargain. Mm -hmm. That is an absolute bargain for both the senior and for the adult child. And what that would include is a month of service where we do... Um, a visit with the senior and do a monthly review. Um, help them reconcile their bank accounts because those seniors of that proud generation, they make sure the bank doesn't make an error, a penny up, a penny down. So My, my mom doesn't want to hear the last time I balanced my bank account, which was <laughs> never. <laughs> exactly, and we start with something very affordable. And what we tell our families, usually in six months of those visits, we have more than paid for ourselves and our services because we find things like the magazine subscription that's paid 12 months in advance, a refund check that we've dug up in the mail that hasn't been deposited. So it's actually a money positive cash inflow to that family. So it's a small investment for that adult child. It's really inexpensive, we'll call it peace of mind and insurance. Now our fees do go up from there when we are the full white glove service or seeing a client more, talking with all of those professionals. And when a senior or the family has handed over the duties and responsibilities of day-to-day -day finances, it doesn't mean we're t working on their information every single day, but ensuring things are flowing that has some other pricing options like monthly fee service package. Okay, now's the fun part. So, Kendall, tell us your favorite success story. Mm. So, I've had several experiences with hoarders, and mm. they're out there more than we believe Oh, or know. I'm so familiar with mm, that. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> so, I worked with a gentleman, uh, and I was referred by a social worker in a rehab facility. He had been in the hospital. He had fallen in his condo, broken a hip, laid on the floor for three days. Kind of that horrible story that we all fear because his kids weren't around. Uh, he didn't have relationships with them. They had a broken relationships, and all he had was some friends. And finally, a friend realized I hadn't heard from him in a couple days, and the fireman broke down the door. And, you know, it's, it's like something out of a movie. And so he went through recovery. And the social worker realized that he didn't have anybody and he was going to go check into a hotel <laughs> to live in a wheelchair after rehab from hip fracture. So they called me and we went through it all. We uh, cleaned out his hoarded bug infested condo. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We arranged for um, assisted living accommodations. I helped him make decisions about all of his belongings with the work of hoarder clean-out companies. Um, I got Is him. Is that what they're called? Hoarder clean-out yeah, companies? Yeah, remedi- remediation companies. There's a whole industry out there, thankfully, that's not afraid to put on some biohazard suits and get in the dirt and clean up the mess. Wow. And um, was able to connect him with his children and slowly but surely up until the time that he passed away all three of his children were at his bedside holding his hand and it was the most beautiful experience and we're still in touch today he's been it's almost exactly a year ago that he passed on and his family still connects with me and they still say things like i can't imagine what we would have done without you i can't imagine how his life would have ended his career was extremely successful a very actually well-known professional in Atlanta in the Atlanta industry and he was sad and alone and he didn't die that way and it was really remarkable that's a wonderful story yeah okay now now you have to make us cry too sorry (laughs) Kendall raised the bar on that one I was gonna say I was gonna say top of that well you know, those don't happen every day. <laughs> but those are the stories that that we recount and one of the joys of, of doing the type of work that we do. So I think back to a client family that came to us a few years ago and it was one of those cases they were proactive and the spouse that paid all the bills, had a terminal diagnosis and we had a meeting set and we were gonna start the transition. And unfortunately the spouse that paid the bills passed suddenly. And so I was stepping into the situation, it was crisis, and so the situation we were trying to avoid is now we're in it. The family has lost a member and we're scrambling. But to, to engage with them in the most tender of moments and they said, just please let us hand this over to you. It was like they had this basket full of not only papers but emotions but overwhelm and they handed that over to us and we were able to help settle the estate and help the executor do that work. And then they looked at me one day and said, well, but you're not going away. And I said, no, we're we're here to support you. That was four years ago. So now we have a single senior who's living and traveling and we have a support role, making sure when they're gone, that things are flowing. And then tragedy strikes one day when that senior suffers a stroke. But things were in place and the senior said, I'm glad four years ago we had this conversation. You came to us by accident. Now not only have you helped us through one tragedy, but now a second medical tragedy. So we've developed that relationship with a family through high points and low points. And now what we have is a great relationship with the existing family members. We've engaged the adult children. And every week we have a conversation with the adult child, the senior, the adult child and I get on the phone and we we talk and we touch base and things are flowing and decisions are being made um, and wishes are being communicated on an ongoing basis and when we get off the phone I hear mother and son say I love you I, I love you too I'm glad we're taking care of this and so that difficult conversation isn't difficult because we're having it through a series of years and so it's fun to see the parent and child reconnect on a really deep level that there aren't many jobs I think in this world that allow you to do that and as Kendall said shed some of those tears and really bond with mm-hmm. some families. So you did make us cry. Yeah. <laughs> those, those, were, those were fabulous uh, stories and, and obviously it's illustrative of how important and valuable your services are. <laughs> um, as we're getting close to uh, wrapping up our show we'd like for each of you to give our listeners your contact information, website, hashtag, social media. Kendall, you first. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my company is Aging Life Care of Atlanta, and that's my website, aginglifecareofatlanta.com. Uh, I'm a sole proprietor, uh, owner, it's just me, and um, I am a part of the Aging Life Care Association. Uh, you can find me on their list serve as well. For people listening in that are not in Metro Atlanta, there's a way to find a care manager in your area, zip code search, that sort of thing on the aginglifecare.org web- website, and you'll find my information there too. Uh, my phone number, everything is listed there. Thank you. Nanette? Great. Thank you, Robert. I am a 
professional daily money manager. I was the first certified in the state of Georgia for that. So I encourage listeners to go out and if they're somewhere nationwide and they need a local presence, they can go to aadmm.com. If you're based here in Atlanta, whether your parent is here or you're the adult child, you can reach out to us at organizedinstincts.com. Our phone number is there. We also have a social media presence on facebook.com slash organized instincts, Twitter, and other social media platforms. I want to thank everyone for listening to Wealth Matters today, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. For more information about Gaslowitz Frankel, please go to our website at gaslowitzfrankel.com and remember to follow us on Twitter at a state dispute and use our show's hashtag Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Nanette Duffy with Organized Instincts and Kendall Cry with Aging Life Care of Atlanta. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. (laughs) 